In the tapestry of global industrialization, few stories are as compelling and inspiring as that of Chung Ju Young, the founder of Hyundai Group. Born into abject poverty in a war-torn Korea, Jung's journey from a humble farmer's son to the architect of one of the world's largest conglomerates is a testament to unwavering determination, visionary leadership, and an indomitable spirit. Imagine a life where poverty isn't just common, it's inescapable. At 14, you're forced to leave school to work on a barren farm, your dreams crushed under the weight of survival. Every day is a struggle, and every attempt to dream beyond the fields is met with harsh reality. Your own father, instead of nurturing your aspirations, drags you back each time you try to escape, telling you that dreaming is a luxury you can't afford. This was the reality for Chung Ju Young, born into poverty in a small village in North Korea. His father, like many others, believed that the farm was the only future, but Chung saw beyond the fields. He envisioned a world where he could build something extraordinary, a life far removed from the dust-covered roads of his village. As a child, Chung was different. While his siblings accepted their fate, Chung would often gaze at the distant mountains, wondering what lay beyond them. The expectations placed upon him by his father weighed heavily, creating a deep internal conflict. He felt the duty to support his family, to be the strong, reliable eldest son. Yet, there was a burning desire within him to break free, to explore the world beyond the village, and to make something more of himself. One night, after a long day of work on the farm, Chung sat alone, staring at the distant hills. The moonlight cast shadows on the ground, and he imagined those shadows as roads leading away from the village roads that only he could see. Is this all there is? He whispered to himself, feeling a pang of desperation. It was in that moment, beneath the silent sky, that he made a vow to himself. He would find a way out, no matter the cost. Fast forward a few decades, and Chung Ju Young's name is synonymous with ambition and innovation. As the founder of Hyundai, he built an empire from the ground up, turning dreams into reality despite overwhelming odds. The road to success was paved with challenges that tested his resolve at every turn. To understand Hyundai's rise, we must first explore the life of its founder, Chung Ju Young. Born in 1915 in Tongchon, North Korea, Chung's world was one where poverty didn't just shape dreams, it strangled them. As the eldest of seven children, his responsibilities were set before him, but so was a burden of expectation that weighed heavily on his young shoulders. The farm was not just a place of work, it was a symbol of the family's identity, rooted in generations of tradition. But to Chung, it felt like a prison. At just 14, Chung's life took a harsh turn. His parents, struggling to provide, decided that education was a luxury they could no longer afford. Chung was forced to drop out of school, and with that, his early dream of becoming a school teacher faded. Yet, even as he worked the fields, his mind was elsewhere, imagining a life beyond the relentless grind of farm work. Chung's dissatisfaction with farm life grew as he entered his teenage years, he began to feel the weight of his father's expectations more acutely. His father, a man of few words, was strict and often harsh, believing that the only way to survive was through hard, relentless work. You are the eldest son, his father would say. You must be strong for the family. But Chung's strength came from a different place. It wasn't just about enduring, it was about transforming. At 16, after selling wood in a nearby city, Chung glimpsed a life of comfort and opportunity, far removed from his harsh reality. The bustling streets, the well-dressed people, and the smell of food from roadside vendors painted a picture of a world he had never known. It was as if the city called to him, offering a taste of freedom he had longed for. Inspired by a newspaper ad seeking laborers, Chung made his first escape, trekking over 15 miles to Ko Wan to work as a construction laborer. Though the pay was meager, the taste of independence was intoxicating. For the first time in his life, 
Chung felt the thrill of making his own decisions, of shaping his own destiny. But his freedom was short-lived. His father, believing his son's ambitions were reckless, tracked him down and forcibly brought him back. You're not meant for anything beyond these fields, his father would sternly say. Dreams are for those who can afford to fail. After three failed escape attempts, the weight of his father's words bore heavily on Chung. He began to doubt himself, to wonder if perhaps his father was right, that dreaming was indeed a luxury he couldn't afford. Yet, at 18, driven by desperation and a fierce determination, Chung devised his boldest plan yet, his fourth and final escape. Under the cover of night, he left home for Seoul, determined that this time he would not be brought back. As he walked away from his village, he didn't look back. The road ahead was uncertain, but for Chung, it was the only road worth taking. Seoul in the 1930s was a city of contrasts, a place where modernity clashed with tradition. For Chung, it was both a land of opportunity and a crucible that would test his resolve. The city was teeming with life, full of people from all walks of life, each chasing their own dreams. For Chung, it was a place of endless possibility. Chung arrived in Seoul with little more than the clothes on his back and a determination to succeed. The city was overwhelming, but it was also invigorating. Everywhere he looked, there were signs of progress. Buildings rising from the ground, cars zipping through the streets, and shops filled with goods he had never seen before. It was a stark contrast to the life he had left behind. Chung took on any job he could find. Handyman, construction worker, laborer. But his big break came as a delivery boy for a rice store. With relentless work ethic and unwavering dedication, Chung quickly gained a reputation among customers and the store owner alike. In just six months, he was promoted to store manager, a testament to his determination and business acumen. But managing a store was not enough for Chung. His mind was constantly turning, always looking for ways to improve, to grow. He began to study the business, learning everything he could about supply chains, customer service, and pricing strategies. His nights were spent poring over ledgers, trying to understand the intricate workings of the business world. One evening, as he meticulously calculated profits and losses by candlelight, Chung paused. He thought back to the farm, to his father's stern face, and the life he had left behind. I can't go back, he whispered feeling the weight of his choices. The stakes were higher now. Failure wasn't just about losing money, it was about losing everything he had fought so hard to escape. By 1937, fate intervened in an unexpected way. The store owner, who had fallen gravely ill, recognized that Chung's tireless work ethic and loyalty were unmatched. With no heirs to take over the business, he made the life-changing decision to entrust the entire store to Chung, a young man whose dedication had already proven that he could not only maintain, but grow what had been built. Now a store owner at just 22, Chung renamed the business Kion Gil Rice Store, and quickly became known for offering the lowest prices in the market. It was a moment of triumph, but it was also just the beginning However, success was fleeting, World War II was in full swing, and Korea was under the oppressive rule of the Japanese colonial government. The Japanese seized resources and exploited Korean businesses, forcing farmers to surrender their crops to feed the Japanese military. Under this regime, Chung was forced to shut down his rice shop, throwing him back into hardship. This setback was devastating but it also taught Chung a crucial lesson. Success and failure are not always within one's control. They are often shaped by broader socio-political forces. As he stood in the ruins of his business, Chung realized that to succeed, he needed to be more than just hardworking. He needed to be strategic, adaptable, and unyielding. In 1939, Chung returned to his village, 
but the fields that once seemed to hold him captive now felt like a cage. He didn't stay long. By 1940, he was back in Seoul, determined to find a business that wasn't shackled by Japanese restrictions. He discovered an opportunity in the car repair business, a field the Japanese government hadn't yet clamped down on. Seizing the moment, Chung took out a loan and opened a do service garage. But there was one catch. Chung knew nothing about cars, let alone fixing them. Undeterred, he hired a skilled mechanic and outperformed his competitors by offering lower prices. However, success was tragically short-lived. Just 20 days after opening, a fire broke out in the garage, reducing everything to ashes. His equipment, his customers' vehicles, all of it gone. Despite the crushing setbacks, his garage in ashes, and later the forced merger by the Japanese government, Chung's resolve only hardened. Each failure was a lesson in resilience, and he quickly rebuilt his business from the ground up, growing his workforce and reputation. However, even as his fortunes improved, external forces beyond his control repeatedly threatened to undo his progress, a reality that would shape his strategic mindset in the years to come. This time, Chung wasn't left empty-handed. He returned to his village with 50,000 won in savings. But this wasn't the triumph he had envisioned. It was a temporary reprieve, a small victory in a long and grueling war. It had taken him four tries to escape his village, and now it would take everything he had to turn this small fortune into the life he had always dreamed of. During this period, Chung learned the importance of resilience. Each failure was a setback, but it was also an opportunity to learn, to adapt, and to come back stronger. He began to see challenges not as roadblocks, but as stepping stones on the path to success. This mindset would become a cornerstone of his business philosophy, driving him to take risks and pursue opportunities that others would shy away from. After World War II ended in 1945, Japan's surrender brought Korea the long-awaited liberation from decades of colonial rule. For Chung Ju Young, this newfound freedom was more than just a relief. It was a green light to rebuild his business from the ground up. Wasting no time, Chung reopened his auto repair shop in Seoul, renaming it Hyundai Auto Service. He chose the name Hyundai, which means modernity or contemporary in Korean. This name symbolized more than just a company. It embodied Chung's commitment to leading South Korea into a new era of progress and industrialization. It was a declaration that Hyundai would not only catch up with the modern world, but also help shape it. Free from Japanese rule, Chung expanded his services, focusing on repairs and maintenance for the growing number of American military vehicles stationed in Korea. Word of Chung's reliability spread quickly, and his business grew rapidly, expanding from 30 to 80 employees. But even as his business thrived, Chung's mind was already racing ahead, searching for the next big opportunity. He saw even greater potential in the construction industry. With American forces building structures across Korea, Chung founded Hyundai Civil Works Company in 1947 at just 31 years old. Despite lacking experience in construction, Chung believed he could learn on the job and build something extraordinary. The early days of Hyundai Civil Works were marked by relentless challenges. Chung had to navigate a rapidly changing landscape, where political instability and economic uncertainty were constant threats. But Chung's ability to adapt and his willingness to take risks set him apart. He quickly won major government contracts, working on projects like the repair and expansion of the Jeongbu Expressway, a crucial artery connecting Seoul and Busan. Yet, as Chung ventured into this new territory, his lack of experience posed a significant risk. Failures like the disastrous Gonjong Bridge project tested his resolve. The bridge, meant to be a symbol of progress, became a symbol of his limitations. Accidents and injuries became common, and costs skyrocketed. The bridge piers meant to support the structure disappeared into the river's depths. 
swallowed by the very waters they were supposed to conquer. Chung's determination was tested daily. The weight of his employees' livelihoods and his own reputation bore down on him. He couldn't sleep. The constant pressure and the fear of failure were his constant companions. Yet, despite the setbacks, Chung refused to give up. He took out more loans, sold family properties, and managed to complete the bridge, but at a heavy cost. This failure damaged Hyundai's reputation and strained its finances, but for Chung, giving up wasn't an option. He hit the books, learning everything he could about construction and large equipment. Leveraging his connections, Chung struck a deal with the US Army to import equipment that put Hyundai miles ahead of the competition. With his newfound edge, Chung didn't just bounce back, he bounced forward. Hyundai started building everything from the Soyang Dam to the Gyeongbu Expressway and even the Kori nuclear power plant. Chung's ambition knew no bounds. With zero experience in shipbuilding, he went ahead and built the world's largest shipyard in Ulsan. Internationally, Hyundai took on massive projects like Jubail Industrial City in Saudi Arabia, establishing itself as a global giant. In just two decades, Hyundai had gone from a struggling startup to one of the richest companies in South Korea. Not bad for a man who started with nothing more than a wrench and a dream. Chung's ability to turn failures into opportunities became a hallmark of his leadership. He knew that in the fast-changing world of business, adaptability was key. He instilled this mindset in his team, encouraging them to see every challenge as a chance to innovate. This approach not only helped Hyundai survive its early struggles, but also positioned it to seize new opportunities as they arose. The Rise of Hyundai Motors As Chung's ventures in construction flourished, his ambition turned toward the automotive industry. He saw the potential for a South Korean car that could compete on the global stage, a car that would symbolize the country's rise from the ashes of war. In 1967, he founded Hyundai Motor Company with this vision. The early years of Hyundai Motors were challenging. Chung knew that to build a successful car, he needed expertise that South Korea lacked at the time. He sought out partnerships with established foreign automakers, eventually striking a deal with Ford. The partnership allowed Hyundai to produce its first car, the Hyundai Cortina, based on Ford's model. However, the Cortina was not without its problems. The car was not well suited to South Korea's rugged roads, and its performance was inconsistent. Sales were sluggish, and critics were quick to dismiss Hyundai's ambitions. But Chung was undeterred. He saw the Cortina as a stepping stone, a learning experience that would pave the way for Hyundai's future successes. By the early 1970s, Chung was ready to take Hyundai to the next level. He hired George Turnbull, a former managing director of Austin Morris at British Leyland, to lead the development of a new car, a car that would be uniquely Korean. The result was the Hyundai Pony, South Korea's first mass-produced car. Launched in 1975, the Pony was an instant success, both domestically and internationally. The Pony was more than just a car, it was a symbol of South Korea's industrialization and Hyundai's growing influence. It opened the door for Hyundai's expansion into global markets, beginning with exports to Ecuador and, later, to Europe and Canada. By the 1980s, Hyundai was firmly established as a global player in the automotive industry. But success in the global market wasn't just about producing cars, it was about understanding and adapting to the needs of different markets. Zhang knew that to compete internationally, Hyundai needed to offer something unique, something that set it apart from established brands like Toyota and Ford. He focused on building cars that were affordable, reliable, and tailored to the needs of each market. In Canada, for example, Hyundai marketed the Pony as an affordable, fuel-efficient car that could handle the country's harsh winters. The strategy paid off, and the Pony became one of the best-selling cars in Canada. In Europe, Hyundai emphasized the car's durability and low-maintenance costs, appealing to budget-conscious consumers. 
This ability to adapt to different markets was key to Hyundai's success on the global stage. Hyundai's global strategy was also marked by a commitment to quality and innovation. Chung knew that to compete with the best, Hyundai needed to build cars that were not only affordable but also reliable and well-made. He invested heavily in research and development, establishing Hyundai's own design and engineering centers. This commitment to quality paid off, as Hyundai's cars gained a reputation for reliability, helping the brand gain a foothold in competitive markets like the United States. Hyundai's entry in the US market in the 1980s was a turning point. The Hyundai Excel, introduced in 1986, was an instant hit, thanks to its low price and fuel efficiency. Within months, Hyundai had sold more than 100,000 units, setting a record for the most successful launch of a new brand in the US. But Chung knew that initial success wasn't enough. To stay competitive, Hyundai needed to continually improve its products and services. One of Chung's most strategic moves was the introduction of the Hyundai Advantage, a 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty that was unheard of at the time. This bold move was a game-changer, addressing consumer concerns about quality and reliability while reinforcing Hyundai's commitment to customer satisfaction. The strategy not only boosted sales, but also helped establish Hyundai as a trustworthy brand in the highly competitive US market. Amidst all of Chung's trials, he also had a family to care for. At 15, his parents arranged a marriage for him with the daughter of a neighboring farmer, Bayan Jung Suk. Together, they had eight sons and one daughter, some of whom would later take Hyundai to new heights. Chung was a stern but loving father. He instilled in his children the same values that had driven him, resilience, ambition, and an unwavering belief in the power of dreams. These were not just the lessons of a father, but the guiding principles that would shape the future of Hyundai. One evening, as he sat with his eldest son, Chung Mong Ku on the porch of their home. He shared the story of his early struggles. You must never forget where we come from, he said, his voice firm but warm. The world will try to tell you what you can and cannot do. But remember, it's not where you start that matters, it's where you end up. Chung's approach to parenting was much like his approach to business. He believed in leading by example, showing his children the value of hard work and determination. He was strict but fair, expecting his children to contribute to the family's success while also encouraging them to pursue their own dreams. He made it clear that while the Hyundai name carried weight, it was up to each of them to carve out their own path and uphold the family legacy. As Hyundai continued to grow, so did its ambitions. With government support, including financial backing and tax breaks, Hyundai expanded into industries as diverse as shipbuilding, retail, electronics, and financial services. Chung had realized his dream of creating a multi-industry conglomerate, yet his greatest passion remained within the automotive industry. In the late 1990s, during the Asian financial crisis, Kia Motors, one of South Korea's oldest car manufacturers faced severe financial difficulties. Recognizing an opportunity to expand and stabilize the South Korean automotive industry, Hyundai acquired a controlling stake in Kia in 1998. This acquisition not only saved Kia from bankruptcy, but also solidified Hyundai's position in the global market, ensuring the company's future growth. By the time Chung passed away in 2001, he had laid the foundation for Hyundai to become one of the most influential companies in the world. His legacy was not just in the companies he built, but in the values he instilled in his family and his business. Chung Mong Ku, his eldest son, took over the reins, guiding Hyundai and Kia through a new era of challenges and opportunities. As 
Chung Joo Young's journey came to an end. His legacy was ready to be carried forward by his son, Chung Mong Koo, who had learned from his father's every move. The lessons of resilience, ambition, and innovation were now embedded in the very fabric of Hyundai. With these values at the helm, Chung Mong Koo was prepared to steer Hyundai into a new era, where new challenges awaited, but the spirit of perseverance remained unchanged. Under Chung Mung Koo's leadership, Hyundai Motors continued to thrive, becoming the fifth largest automaker in the world and producing over 7 million vehicles annually. He introduced groundbreaking initiatives like the Hyundai Advantage, a 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty that revolutionized consumer trust in the brand. He also focused on improving manufacturing processes, investing heavily in research and development, and pushing Hyundai and Kia to the forefront of the automotive industry. One of his notable achievements was leading Hyundai's development of its first in-house engine and transmission, reducing the company's dependence on foreign partners and boosting its technological independence. This move not only improved Hyundai's product offerings, but also strengthened its position as a serious contender in the global automotive market. However, the journey wasn't without its challenges. Between 2020 and 2023, Hyundai and Kia faced a surge in thefts due to older models lacking modern anti-theft technology. Yet, true to his father's legacy, Chung Mong Koo responded with resilience, rolling out software updates and reinforcing the company's commitment to customer security. While Chung Mung Koo played a crucial role in Hyundai's continued success, the foundation upon which he built was laid by his father. The values of resilience, adaptability, and relentless pursuit of innovation that Chung Joo Young instilled in the company continued to drive Hyundai forward. Today, Hyundai is not just cruising, they're driving the future. With a laser focus on electric vehicles, cutting-edge technology, and sustainability, Hyundai is revolutionizing the automotive industry. Their bold plans to expand their EV lineup, break new ground in autonomous driving, and lead in eco-friendly transportation signal a bright future. But the road ahead is not without its challenges. The global push for sustainability is reshaping industries at an unprecedented pace. As competitors invest heavily in electric and autonomous vehicles, Hyundai and Kia must continue to innovate or risk being left behind. The rise of artificial intelligence, shifts in consumer behavior, and potential geopolitical tensions are just a few of the hurdles that lie ahead. Hyundai's strategy for the future is focused on innovation and adaptability. The company is investing in new technologies like hydrogen fuel cells, which have the potential to revolutionize the automotive industry. Hyundai is also exploring the possibilities of autonomous driving, with plans to launch fully autonomous vehicles in the coming years. These technologies are still in their early stages, but Hyundai is positioning itself as a leader in this emerging field. Hyundai's commitment to sustainability is also driving its future strategy. The company has set ambitious goals to reduce its carbon footprint and increase its use of renewable energy. Hyundai is investing in new manufacturing processes that are more environmentally friendly and is exploring the use of recycled materials in its vehicles. These efforts are not just about meeting regulatory requirements, they are part of a broader vision for a more sustainable future. Yet, if there's one thing that Chung Joo Young's life teaches us, it's that adversity is not an obstacle, but a stepping stone. Every challenge Hyundai faces today echoes the battles Chung fought in the past. The company's future success will not be measured by the absence of difficulty, but by how it overcomes the inevitable trials that come its way. Chung Joo Young's journey with Hyundai is a masterclass in resilience. Every obstacle he faced, from the grip of poverty and colonial rule to the sting of betrayal, only fueled his determination. Hyundai's story reminds us that true success isn't about avoiding failure, but about rising stronger each time life knocks you down. As we look to the future, 
Hyundai is poised not just to participate in the global automotive revolution, but to lead it. With the foundation laid by Chung Ju Young and the relentless pursuit of innovation under his son, the company is well equipped to navigate the challenges of a rapidly evolving world. Whether through pioneering advances in sustainable energy or redefining mobility through autonomous technology, Hyundai's future is bright, driven by the same spirit of resilience and ambition that has been its hallmark. Chung's legacy is not merely a reflection of past successes, it is the engine propelling Hyundai toward a future where it will not just meet but set the standards of global innovation. As Chung himself once said, it is not necessary to remember one success, that should be remembered by others instead. And remember, we will.